Good afternoon. Thank you, Kathy, for that gracious introduction, and to Rebecca and SLJ for the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about the mission of news literacy, how the news literacy project seeks to fulfill that mission, and some resources that we can share with you for your important work on the front lines of democracy in this incredibly fraught time for our nation. Then I'll throw the floor open for your questions and comments. I'd really like to make this a discussion. In the midst of the 2016 presidential campaign, New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote, when facts become unmoored, everything becomes unmoored. Rarely have more prescient words been spoken. In just the 15 months since Brooks wrote that comment, let's th think about what has transpired. The term fake news has become part of the lexicon, initially describing viral rumors, hoaxes, and conspiracy theories created for profit or political purposes or to sow mischief, but then quickly turned into a weapon to describe news that someone doesn't like and seeks to discredit, whether that's coming from the President of the United States or a student in a classroom. We now know that affiliates of the Russian government engaged in a massive disinformation campaign during the presidential election, intended to sow divisions within the American people, undermine faith in our democracy, and help elect Donald Trump. This included more than 3,000 ads on Facebook that were seen by more than 10 million people and 201 accounts linked to Russian entities created on Twitter. One month after the election, a North Carolina man acting on a widely circulated online conspiracy theory that Hillary Clinton's campaign was running a child sex trafficking ring outside of a wash in, in a Washington pizzeria entered the restaurant with an AR-15 rifle and fired three shots before he was arrested. He was subsequently sentenced to four years in prison in what has widely become known as Pizzagate. Finally, just this past week, in the wake of the horrific massacre in Las Vegas, viral rumors circulated falsely describing the shooter as a Trump-hating liberal and linked to a terrorist group. This prompted journalist Kara Swisher to note aptly, social media has become totally weaponized. This all adds up to one of the great challenges of our time, and one that is particularly relevant to all of you. Fake news and other forms of misinformation and disinformation represent a growing public health crisis, one that is damaging to the nation's democracy and dangerous to the well-being of its citizens and to the world. This is why news literacy and information literacy are so vital today. News literacy is a survival skill in an information age, a new literacy for the 21st century. At stake is the ability of the next generation to navigate in a digital world, the future of quality journalism, and the well-being of the country's civil discourse and civic institutions. This is the mission to which I've dedicated myself for the past decade, why I'm here before you today, a room filled with kindred spirits. Our mission at the News Literacy Project is to work with educators and journalists to give students the ability to know what to believe in a digital world, and to give them the tools to be better students today and better informed and engaged citizens tomorrow. Being news literate means having the ability to discern and create credible information and distinguish it from advertising, uh, opinion, uh, propaganda, and misinformation and disinformation. This is really a survival skill in a digital age. It's the ability to know what information to trust, to share, and to act on. We think that everyone needs to think like a journalist in an information age, because everyone is their own editor, and everybody can be their own publisher. So how does the next generation do this in a way that is credible and responsible and empowers their voices? We work with middle schools and high schools 
uh, sixth to twelfth grade in social studies, history, government, English, journalism classes, and increasingly with librarians as well. We believe that the mission is absolutely essential for three reasons. First of all, it's a key to bringing education into the 21st century. We're reaching students where they live, which as you know well, is on their devices, and giving them the tools to use them in ways that are responsible and empowering. It's also critical for the survival of quality journalism, because without an appreciation for it, there will seek to be a demand for it. And one of the key tenets that we teach is an appreciation for the role of the First Amendment and a free press and a democracy, especially the watchdog role. And ultimately, it's really critical for the well-being of the, our democracy, be, which is founded upon the precept of an informed and engaged electorate that is capable of making in, informed decisions in its own self-interest. So we do this with a number of partners. We've got 34 news organizations uh, that have joined us in partnership. And in addition, you'll see a Facebook is on here. Um, we are working with them as well um, as they have come to recognize um, their role in the, on the platform in terms of the, this growing uh, scourge of fake news. Um, and we have a number of other partnerships um, in the works. In our first uh, eight years, uh, we developed a classroom program and an after-school program starting in New York, uh, Chicago, and the Washington, D.C. region, and then we moved to Houston as well, um, and then a, a rudimentary digital unit as well. Um, and in the, in the classroom program, we actually we developed original curriculum, uh, engaging lessons. Uh, we brought journalists into the classroom to do lessons. Uh, we have over 400 journalists who have now done over 700, in our, enrolled in our online directory, who have done over 700 lessons in person or virtually. And um, uh, we had students do projects that reflected and built on our core principles. In the first eight years, uh, we reached over 25,000 students in those four regions. But we also knew that that's a drop in the bucket with more than 27 million students in public secondary schools alone. Um, and we wanted to move, to build on that foundation, to move to national scale. So we worked with a firm in Pittsburgh uh, over the course of 16 months to develop a virtual classroom, uh, which was the culmination of all of our work to date. It's a highly robust and cutting edge web-based platform that it teaches the precepts of news literacy in ways that engage students in active uh, and real-world learning. So we have journalists who are virtual teachers and guides who lead lessons as well as other subject matter experts. There are four custom interactives, so students learn how journalists determine how they filter information, determine what is news, and then they're presented with 21 stories. stories. They have to decide what five go on their home page, what are the lead and what is the off lead, and they actually see that happen. They press a button and their home page comes up and they reflect upon that. They learn about the core principles of the First Amendment and the five freedoms, and then they're presented with landmark cases on speech and press, most of them involving students in schools, and then they have to decide if those cases would be covered or not and reflect on that. We use the standards of quality journalism as an aspirational yardstick against which to measure all news and information. So they're presented actually with a breaking news story and thrown into it as a rookie reporter. And they have to interview primary eyewitness sources, government official sources, expert sources. They have to get documents and tweet and then reflect upon that as a consumer in terms of the challenge of getting things right. Um, the platform is blended, so we do professional development around it. Uh, we have a guide that goes with it. It can be done one-to-many, projected on a screen or smart board, and it can be done one-to-one -one with individual logins for every student, in which case there's self-pacing and remediation. Students can also earn digital points and badges. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give you, hopefully, uh, a look at the virtual classroom.
Authorities actually airlifted the family of father and his funny. I woke up this morning and it's interesting. So much information. You and your generation have more information at your fingertips than any other generation in history. Students are faced with a barrage of information, whether it's from their phone or the television, and they don't really necessarily have the discerning skills to figure out, how do I trust this information source? Anyone can pretty much create a blog now or a website, but is it credible or not? So who's it coming from? Are they professionals? So they need to ask those questions. Welcome to the Checkology platform. This is where students gain tools to evaluate the credibility of information and separate fact from fiction. The Checkology virtual classroom is really impressive. It's a very sleek tool. Students are now being introduced to a lot of this new tech tool that's going to revolutionize their classroom experience. Websites like Google, Facebook, Netflix, and YouTube can learn about you and try and deliver, bring stuff specifically for you. We were put into the shoes of a journalist and um, we got to investigate a fictional event. This was very hands-on and interactive. We need you on the scene. Okay. Yeah. Like when they um, receive the information, we'll know whether or not it's credible. Um, why is verification important? I think that I understand the process journalists go through more now. That means you, yes you, can have the power to be a citizen watchdog. Now I'm looking at new sites where I know for a fact that these are true. That's amazing, isn't it? Like that's going to happen? That's only like source that covered it. It could be like made up or false information. I see them just questioning, looking, um, and even searching for answers in ways that they didn't do before they started this. This looks real, I don't know. Now you're ready to get started on your journey to becoming a Czechologist. It's time to check it out. So you too can check out Checkology at checkology.org and I, uh, you're all welcome to do so. We launched Checkology on May 2nd, 2016. Um, it built traction prior to the election. Uh, things really began to move as you might imagine after the election. NPR did a piece on the platform and called it this classroom where fake news fails, that things really took off. And as of this week, we've got over 8,500 educators who teach over 1.2 uh, million students in every state in the U.S., uh, rural and urban areas, and 67 countries around the world who have registered to use the platform. We have an interactive map that shows the global reach. You can see all the pins on the United States, and you can also see the reach throughout. Interestingly, in the far upper right corner, there's a photo that obscures the fact that there's one vast area where there are no educators who are registered, and that happens to be in Russia. The international market took us by surprise. Since we weren't marketing internationally, this is a it's kind of American-centric platform in English uh, with a lesson on the First Amendment. Um, but we've got educators all over the world, as I mentioned, including significant numbers in, in Canada and Australia, as you might expect, but then also China, Japan, and Hungary. We even have an educator who registered in Macedonia, the, the home of all of those fake news factories. Since we're in Tennessee, I'm showing you the numbers here. Um, and I know we've got a spirited group from the outstanding Nashville Public Library with us here today. Um, so we've got significant numbers here. Um, and we've got a very large and growing number uh, in libraries. The very first educator we trained was a school librarian in Queens, and she said this is a dream come true for teachers. Uh, we're doing significant pilots with the New York Public Library, the Miami Dade Public Library, um, and we're talking with the ALA, um, who we've worked with in the past, about possibly doing uh, a national partnership, including creating a public library facing version of the platform that might be geared more toward an adult audience. We know we're having impact because we've done a lot of pre and post unit assessment of students from the beginning and of teachers subsequently. Um, we know that students immediately begin to consume more news. Um, they um, say 80 to 90 percent say they're more confident in their ability to create and, cons and uh, evaluate credible information. Um, they're more skeptical about what they see online and less inclined to share it immediately. Uh, they gain a greater appreciation of the First Amendment, the role of journalism and democracy, 
and important for us, half to two-thirds say they're more inclined to vote in elections when they're old enough to do so. We also know anecdotally that this can be transformational, particularly for students from underserved communities. Uh, the student in the upper left, Christian Armstrong, uh, grew up in a very tough neighborhood in Chicago, the old block where Michelle Obama had grown up. Um, he was disengaged from the wider world. Um, after doing news literacy, he was, he was debating public issues in class. He was tweeting with a columnist for the Chicago Tribune. Um, and he said at a public event that we did with Michael Wilbon in Chicago, this class has definitely changed my life. We prioritize news literacy over all else. The newspaper is considered to be our holy grail. The young woman on the right, uh, Janari Mitchell, um, also um, found the Czechology quite transformational in her world and um, became um, so engaged with us uh, that we actually gave her an award in honor of Gwen Eiffel, who had been a member of our board until we tragically lost her a year ago. Um, and Janari um, uh, wrote a terrific essay in, in which she said, learning how to distinguish between false and factual information allows us to control the news we consume instead of allowing the news we consume to control us. We're really just getting started. As I mentioned, um, we're, we're still, our numbers while, while growing are very small uh, given our aspiration, which is to see news literacy embedded in the American educational experience inside the classroom and outside. So we want to increase the reach of Czechology, hopefully with your help. Um, we are already looking at a 2.0 and even more engaging interactive version uh, and, and planning to start to create a Spanish language version and an international version. We plan to develop a mobile app that will supplement Czechology and also reach audience outside of schools. We've started a new program called News Lit Camps where we bring large numbers of educators, including librarians, into newsrooms for a day of structured professional development around topics of interest to the educators. Um, and we've now done three of these at the Chicago Sun-Times in Chicago with the Chicago Public Schools, uh, Time Magazine in New York with educators in the tri-state area. And we just did one this week in Miami at the Miami Herald with the Miami-Dade County Schools and we're looking to do a lot more of them. And I mentioned our work with Facebook. We did a public service ad campaign with Facebook that reached nearly eight million of the most frequent uh, consumers and sharers of fake news on the platform. Um, and this was adults age 45 to 65 that um, prompted a considerable amount of engagement. Also, I want to mention I've created a couple of other resources. Uh, we now have a weekly newsletter for educators called The Sift, in which we take hoaxes and viral rumors and conspiracy theories, whether they are around the hurricanes or around the shooting in Las Vegas, and we turn them into timely lessons and teachable, teachable moments with links and discussion prompts and ideas. And I'm happy to get any of you on the list to receive The Sift and the rest of our resources. So with that, I want to close and then open the floor up. And I want to quote another columnist, a Margaret Sullivan, who wrote this past week in the Washington Post, there is such a thing as verifiable reality. There is such a thing as valid fact-based journalism. And while it may be hard to pin down, there is such a thing as truth. I want to invite you to stand with us on behalf of verifiable reality, fact-based journalism, and truth. Our education system, the next generation, real news, and the country's democracy cry out for us to wage this good fight together. Thank you. So I welcome questions and comments. Yes? Do you have any plans to do anything? I looked on your site, you've got K through 12, or 6 through 12. Do you have any plans on doing things for elementary? So from the beginning, this question has arisen about do we, do we go younger, do we go older, do we do the adult population? At, at this point, we don't. Um, because there's only, uh, my staff, we just added a great new staff for yesterday. We're now up to 10 in three regions and obviously doing a lot. Um, we have found some educators are using at least parts of the platform. By the way, you can use any lesson, any module, any resource on the platform, um, any way that you want as an educator. So the one-to-many um, educators at younger grade levels actually are using some of the lessons. And there's a lot of, of gamification built in um, so that when you do one-to-many and you can do more scaffolding, you can actually go a little younger with some. We're also finding a lot of community colleges are using some of the lessons and even colleges as well. I noticed that 
down 17 to 18 is free. Do you have a, a price point that you're looking at for the future? So that's a great question. Um, so um, we built the platform to, to be our primary path to scale and also sustainability. Um, so we do plan ultimately to be charging for the premium version, the one-to-one, -one, a modest price point, um, while continuing to make the basic version, the one-to-many, available at no cost. And the plan is to begin doing that with a, a marketing distribution partner in the, for the 2018-19 school year. So both are available at no cost, and I would encourage you to try the premium version now when you have the opportunity at this point. We haven't set a definite price point. It will be low. Um, and discounted for bulk purchase. I mean, we're talking at this point possibly, you know, $3 a student is the number we're working with. We're also looking at potential third-party funders. And we're actually, you know, we've had begun some discussions um, whether on an individual basis, you know, a, a, a PTSA, a school foundation, um, donors choose, individual teachers, or maybe on a larger basis to find a foundation or a tech company or social media company that would want to fund um, sales. Um, so we want to, we really, what we want to do now is build demand and interest and that will actually help us in finding sponsors to pay, help pay for it. Thank you, Alan. This is really helpful. I'm very excited about it. What I wonder about in terms of sustainability and the legs of the impact of the instruction is when students complete, they get badges, they move through this, what happens in terms of their behavior um, as they do research, as they read m beyond Czechology, have you seen any research that talks about its long-term impact? Short-term, you've only in just introduced this, but what's the impact beyond the program? So that's also a very good question. We, we know anecdotally um, that this has significant impact. In fact, in the very first year we did this uh, with a school in, um, in the Hell's Kitchen in New York, a facing history school, we had a student come back who was in college and he told his teacher that he had a friends who were encouraging him to invest in a can't miss uh, scheme to make money. And he remembered that a journalist in, in his news literacy class had said, trust but verify. We tend to say, check it out. But he didn't invest and it turned out it was a Ponzi scheme and a lot of his friends lost much of their college savings. And that's the kind of thing that we hear anecdotally. We also occasionally hear back from students in college and, and they're applying the skills. Um, just this week I talked to two students who are gonna be involved in an event who are in high school now. One of them said that he, he got all his news from Instagram. If he tended to agree with it, he, he would believe it. If he didn't agree with it, he would discard it, the power of confirmation bias. The other student said she got all of her news through Twitter and she believed everything and shared everything. And now they're very discerning, they're skeptical, they're applying what they've learned. The young woman it actually reads the Washington Post and is watching CNN. Um, so we know it has a, a very broad impact. We would like to be able to track students longitudinally. I mean, it would be ideal with enough resources to do that. We also have plans when we get the funding for it to create a community practice, an entirely new platform that would allow students who've done Czechology to put what they've learned into practice in the real world to fact check stories, to check stories for bias in a, in a community with a curated community with journalists where they can make those assessments analysis to create PSAs and, and videos and memes about news literacy where they can become the teachers and teach back broadly and then be engaged in an online community. That would allow them to go to the next step and apply the skills that they've learned. I'd love to see confirmation bias as a phrase that's part of vocabulary of every child who sits so that's a big, that's a significant piece of the platform. You saw a little bit of the lesson on algorithms, the role of personalizing information. That's in there. We also have a lesson on bias, and that's in there too. There's a huge and growing problem, as you all know, in a hyper-partisan age, and, and one that really does need to be addressed educationally.